a couple minutes after, so I think we can get started. Uh, appreciate everyone again joining us. Hopefully, uh, I see a number of attendees that joined last week's presentation from Jim, our director of simulation. So, Barry Robbins, I believe, um, uh, or Jim Shaw today will be continuing on that uh, update as well. So, um, you want to transition? Uh, for many of you, I did see some new faces. Obviously, as a product development consulting company, uh, our engineers internally leverage simulation and we help customers with adoption. So, excited to. Hopefully, uh, many of you on today's audience are either using Space Claim or looking to learn more about Space Claim. Um, but we have a lot of experience with the tool, uh, in addition to other tools, and just have some partnerships. So, excited to have you join, and really want to maximize the time. So, uh, without further ado, I'll, I'll transition it over to uh, to the guys. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, John. Yep. So this is Jim. Uh, as I was mentioning before, we're going to be recording this and putting it up on YouTube and uh, Terry and Don and myself represent the application engineering team here at Boston Engineering, really focused on uh, deploying and supporting uh, and helping to, to get the tools like ANSYS uh, and, and mentioned, I think, pre PTC before. So really a full suite of tools for design, product development and simulation. So today we're going to be talking about simulation, particularly ANSYS Workbench, which is the, the tool uh, that we're using for structural analysis and fluid dynamics and a whole host of multi-physics. And even more specifically within the Workbench, we're going to be looking at a software program called SpaceClaim. SpaceClaim is a CAD modeler, and I'm, I'm assuming that most people in the audience already have a CAD modeler. I'm using air quotes. I already have a CAD program. Uh, we're going to be showing you some of the more unique features in SpaceClaim specifically for preparing for analysis, so preparing for FEA or structural analysis, or preparing for CFD or fluid dynamics. Particularly, we're going to be looking at how to repair bad geometry. And Terry and I were just talking about this three minutes ago um, on common things that we see when we are importing from another CAD tool, whether it's SolidWorks or Creo, Inventor or Katia. Uh, we're going to be talking about some workflows for simplifying and defeaturing. And again. One of the things that we really want to do before we jump into a, a physics simulation is look at different levels of detail. Do we need a small radius here or a small curve here? And then there's some specific tasks that we need to do when we're about to, for example, mesh for a structural analysis or we're about to mesh for a fluid dynamics analysis. And so we're going to be talking about some of those as well. Uh, this is the second of a two part series it's focusing on space claim. Last week, actually, uh, we, excuse me, had focused more on the CAD modeling side, some of the direct, uh, direct versus sketch-based modeling, and so this week is really sort of a follow-on to that. So, um, if uh, if you missed last week, uh, by the time uh, this comes out for YouTube, the other ones will be up as well. So, uh, kind of a one-two punch, so to speak. And then we'll be a little Q and A at the end. Um, I'll say this: it was a little quiet last week, so for those who have questions, please don't be shy. Um, I'm going to go a little quick through the demo, and again, as I mentioned, this is kind of dense and fast, and uh, I'll apologize beforehand, so maybe write a question down, and then at the end, we can have a more open Q&A uh, as I jump back in the tool and I can answer some questions. Before we jump into space claim, I want to remind everybody using this very uh, sort of simple flowchart that space claim and pre-processing and CAD geometry, they are really steps in a larger process. And so at the top of the screen, we can see we've got, a, a, I'm breaking down simulation to three most fundamental uh, pieces, pre-processing, solving, and post-processing. That solving part in the middle, that's pretty much all the computer. So we're not gonna really talk about that much. Pre-processing and post-processing is where we, the humans, are getting into uh, the software, and particularly in pre-processing, meaning all of the work that we do prior to hitting the solve button is the most important work. In fact, when we're doing uh, services for any of our customers or uh, looking at and auditing a process for our customers, I can tell you with 100% confidence, 50% of the time spent in simulation is in pre-processing. Solving and post-processing can actually be automated quite heavily. Pre-processing still requires uh, a, a human to be sitting at the laptop, so to speak. So we're not going to get replaced by, by computer software robots anytime soon. So particularly within pre-processing, which includes uh, applying material properties, uh, bringing in our CAD geometry, uh, 
creating a mesh, which is probably one of the most important things, uh, and then adding in loads, constraints, and other boundary conditions to our analysis. Um, that CAD geometry, that is the step we're looking at today. Again, so within ANSYS Workbench, when we have the bottom right-hand corner, I have showed two workflows in Workbench. Uh, the orange one sort of on top left hand corner is a workflow for a static structural analysis. So we see sort of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And it's that third step uh, that we're going to be focused on today using space claim to prepare geometry. Uh, additionally, if you're from a background of more thermal fluid analysis, you might recognize the workflow in the green at the bottom right hand corner. So that is the new workflow in ANSYS Workbench for fluent with fluent meshing. And so you can see uh, we've got a geometry. Uh, component and that's connected to uh, the mesh component that's the meshing within fluent so um, by the way in a few weeks we're going to be doing another webinar specifically on fluent and fluent meshing so if you're interested to see that workflow uh, we're going to be doing that in October the older workflow ISM CFD meshing um, workbench meshing uh, spending weeks and weeks and weeks trying to pre-process stuff uh, that's going out the door because fluent meshing is, uh, is going to be quite easy, but still means we need to spend some time in our geometry and space claim. So space claim comes in two flavors. Uh, there's the space claim standalone. That's the full up program that we uh, install and has all of the functionality. So we call it a quote unquote deep bench of geometry tools, but really it's the full functionality uh, and uh, is specifically used when preparing models for ANSYS Workbench, so our ANSYS mechanical software, which is for structural analysis, thermal stress, and also CFD, so uh, ANSYS Fluent and CFX. Uh, and it can be used as a, and again, air quotes here, only my only CAD program, right? And, and recall, uh, Space Claim 15 plus years ago, before it uh, was acquired by ANSYS, was its own CAD program. So it has a full suite of functionality. So it's not just a CAD program within an FEA tool or a CFD tool. It is a standalone CAD program. And we showed some of those CAD, some of those unique CAD capabilities last week. Um, the second sort of flavor that it comes in, and this is more for people who are, whether you're a designer or you're a part-time analyst or you're new to ANSYS, um, that capability, most of it, is embedded in the new ANSYS discovery tool. And so two months ago, we actually uh, covered that capability. It's a brand new tool uh, as of July, a complete refresh, uh, really, really cool stuff. And it's a combination of, uh, I'll say the most commonly used space claim uh, capabilities, the most uh, commonly uh, used structural analysis and the most commonly used fluid analysis. So the ANSYS discovery tool is a great way to kind of get a little bit of everything. Um, but today we're going to be focusing on the top, which is space claim standalone. We're going to go uh, further down into the deeper sort of capability set. Here is an example of all of the different CAD uh, focused capabilities. So we went through, I would say, maybe two, 10 to 25 percent of these capabilities last week. Uh, and so this is really centered around my creating geometry, my manipulating geometry and whatnot. But further down in the capability are the repair tab the prepare tab and the workbench tab so in the repair tab which is what we're going to be starting off with here in a few minutes we're going to be looking at stitching up surfaces that aren't connected uh, any curves that aren't perfectly lined any faces that are missing uh, and we're going to be preparing our geometry for again structural or fluid analysis and then on the workbench tab we've got some unique capabilities uh, when you're preparing just before going into the workbench. And you can kind of see in the bottom right hand corner of the slide, we've got that ANSYS transfer. So any geometry that we, we, uh, we prepare here in space can, can go straight into uh, AIM, uh, which is the, the now turning into discovery. So I think this might be the last version where it goes into AIM, but also mechanical and fluent, which are gonna be around for a long time. So the top sort of five, if you will, that I've kind of highlighted for today, and I, going to try to squeeze it into 30 minutes, but I'm going to be perfectly candid and honest. I don't think I'm going to be able to do that. It might take a little bit longer, so hang tight, please. Uh, the first is looking at bad geometry. And again, many times as an analyst, we're getting geometry from somebody else, or uh, we're not owning that original CAD geometry. Instead, it's coming from whether it's a supplier or a customer, uh, step file, I just file, or maybe even native. So coming straight out of Creo or straight out of SOLIDWORKS. So Every time we do that, there's something lost in translation, right? If I go from English to Spanish to German, back to English again, 
there's a very low likelihood I'm going to get the same sentence that I started out with. And so the same is with geometry. So we've got a couple of really cool techniques to fix this. And I know you're going to say, Jim, this is a pre-programmed -pre kind of demo. I assure you, uh, I've been in Space Game a lot in the last nine months straight, and I, it has fixed everything I've thrown at it. So these are really robust uh, methods. We're going to be looking really quickly at simplifying and defeaturing. Uh, I say quickly because a lot of us as uh, simulation or analyst designers or those in, in ANSYS, we do a lot of simplifying and defeaturing. It's pretty easy. I click on something, I hit delete, it goes away. But there's a two unique ways in managing radii and defeaturing that are in space thing that, that I haven't seen in CREA or SOLIDWORKS or any other CAD tools. So we'll go through those two. Um, we're going to look at number three, splitting faces. And there's a variety of reasons why we might want to break a face up. So we'll talk about that. And then number four and five are specific for structural analysis uh, and then fluid analysis. So um, hang tight. We've got a lot of really cool things. Okay. That is one too many. So we're going to go into space claim. And I've got uh, eight models here. And I'm going to open up a ninth. And I just want to show everyone again. You don't have to have the CAD program. I don't have to have Trio. I don't have to have uh, SolidWorks or any of those native CAD programs to open up these files. Um, I can open them up straight into to, uh, Space Claim. I've done that for all but one, just to show the process. Uh, and again, here are all the supported CAD programs to uh, sketch up some of some some pretty rare ones, I should say. Uh, and then the not so rare ones like Step and Igis and Parasol. So this Blade X underscore T. Uh, that's a text-based parasolid file, and those are usually coming out of a tool like uh, Siemens NX or uh, maybe Onshape or something like that. So we're just going to import that geometry. And what's common with that is as the geometry comes in, it's not what we thought it was, right? So it's not a solid model. And in this case, we have a few indications as to why and how this is not a solid model. So the first is this geometry, I'm just going to slide the tab over, this geometry is transparent. That's the first visual cue that we have, that we don't have a solid model. The second is on the left-hand side, you can see that we've got a list of surfaces. And so we've got this purple icon and conveniently the name surface here. But if I wanted to mesh this for a structural analysis, this is a, a turbine blade, for example, or a turbo machinery application, I might want to do a thermal stress analysis. I might want to heat this thing up and then cool it down and heat it up and cool it down and see, uh, am I going to get any stress concentrations. And so to do that, I need to mesh the model. To mesh it, it needs to be solid. So uh, the first thing I'm going to do is go to the repair tab. And right here, we have a whole section called Solidify. And so these three tools, pretty much you can click in any order, uh, and you're going to create uh, a solid model from whatever set of surfaces came in. Uh, and so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to stitch. And what stitch does is it takes all of the surfaces that we have in this model and attempts to stitch them together. And it even shows us some of the problem areas you can see highlighted in red. Uh, it says one stitchable edge. Uh, this looks like more than one to me, to be honest, but we're gonna hit the green check mark and see what happens. And again, I'm starting off with 16 surfaces uh, here in the model. So I hit the green check mark. I'm gonna be left with three, okay. So one is the main surface that I really want to work with here. And let's take a look and see what the other two are. I'm just gonna hit escape for a second come out of that tool. So surface 15, if we zoom in down here, it's highlighted orange. You can see that something happened on the import where it might have been a bit of tolerance on that radius, but you can see the surface itself is kind of popped up and that's not going to work well, right? So there's an air gap in here in between these two surfaces. So I'm actually just going to go in and delete that corner and I'm guessing it's the other corner, right? Sometimes these things happen sort of in symmetry and you can see once again, for some weird reason, uh, and maybe I could go into the options on import, or if I know somebody who exported this model, I could say, hey, you know what, can you change your output options? But the reality is um, I don't have that time to wait. So I'm down to my one surface. The next thing I'm going to look at are for gaps or missing faces. So I know I have missing faces. I just deleted two of them. So why don't we just use that tool? And this missing faces tool is going to find eight. And you can see, and again, this, this model candidly has been prepared here, but this is very, very common. So I might have a little sliver. And again, it might be just a tolerance of this curve is supposed to be here instead of here. And it could happen either on export or import. And of course, we've got some blatant missing faces that I just deleted. So in this case, what I can do is just click on, you see there's a highlighted contour, and I'm just going to close that surface up. And you can see it's in there. And I can just go through and close this up, close this up. 
or hit the green check mark and close them all up. Once I close them all up, if it is what we call a watertight model, meaning if all of the surfaces are now zipped up, they're touching, and if I were to theoretically fill this volume with water, I would have no leaks, then I have a solid. And it will automatically, you can see, convert this to solid. This is now a solid model. This is what we call a watertight uh, volume. And I can now save this file, go into Workbench, into Structural Analysis, mesh it, and move forward. So, when in doubt, if you open up an uh, if you open up a model and you see a bunch of surfaces, first thing you want to do is stitch and then check for gaps or missing faces or anything like that. Here's another example. Uh, this is the top of a piston head here. And let's say, for example, uh, I open this up and say, oh, shoot, I have a surface. And I need to get a solid model because, again, I might want to do a thermal stress analysis or some sort of structural analysis. I don't need to stitch this because a stitch is going to try to stitch together multiple surfaces. So I already have a surface. So what I'm going to look for are gaps. And you can see that it's got 40 areas here. And this is actually something that happened. It looks like a pattern feature that was done in the CAD. And you can see that it's sort of, uh, you know, kind of re repeated around the part. And so, uh, again, I might want to box select and see exactly how many there are. Um, sometimes it's not as clean as, as working 100% of the time. But in this case, I'm just going to box select all of them, stitch it up, cross my fingers and we have a solid model. And I know that because again, I'm not transparent here in the graphic screen and I have my green solid icon here next to the model. So I, from now, from this point, I can hit uh, save and move on to a structural analysis. Now, those were pretty well prepared because I was able to just hit those tools and move forward. And as I mentioned before, I come from a parametric CAD background, Creo for almost 20 years, SolidWorks for over 10 years. So I'm pretty used to Either I own that parametric geometry, so I can go back and tweak the sketch and do whatever, uh, or uh, I, I'll pull in and import things and try to use those tools. But a lot of times uh, I run out of techniques on the other side of the fence, if you will, uh, and I have it or I don't have access to that CAD file uh, or that CAD software, and so I'm in space clean. And uh, let's say I wanted to solidify this. Again, I've got a single surface. I hit stitch. There's no stitchable edges. I hit gaps. There's no identifiable gaps and there's six missing faces. So if I were to zoom in and see at the end of this, I've got a little problem. For some reason on import or export or whatever, I have a face missing and if I hit that, we get this error. I cannot replace the face with a single face, okay? What do I do now? Well, there's a really cool technique where we basically want to encompass this geometry with new geometry that works. So underneath my design, tab, I have the ability to create or add a sphere. And this is probably the easiest way to do it. I could add a cylinder if I wanted, but I'm going to add a sphere. And I'm just going to add, this is going to create a solid sphere in the location that I want. So I'm just going to come in, grab that, pull it open, and I'm trying to encompass that bad geometry. And I've got six areas I need to do this, and I'm just going to encompass this with a sphere that's a little bit bigger than my problem area. I think there's another one over here. And I think I've got two more over here. And again, I don't want to go too big, right? I don't want to encompass too much. I just want to encompass the area that I need to fix. And now that I've got six solid spheres and one surface, I can go to my combine tool. We talked about this a little bit last week, just a Boolean operation. I can grab all of these and I can combine them together. As Soon as I do that, I have now created a solid model that is a mixture of the original geometry that I want plus these sort of clean, if you will, spheres. And now I can just use our fill tool. And we talked about this a little bit last week. The fill tool is just gonna grab, oops, grab geometry. So I'll just make sure I grab the surface here. And as soon as I quote unquote fill it in, it's going to project the surfaces that are around it uh, towards that geometry that's missing. So now I'm just gonna go in and I'm just gonna fill all of my spheres in. And that's a really, clean and easy way to take geometry that is not fixable with our, our our tools under repair and just get the bad stuff out and then fill it back in and if i were to go back to uh, for example display and my wireframe this allows us to kind of look through the part and you can see i've got really nice clean geometry none of those bad surfaces are are here again from now i would hit save and move on
to either my FTA or my CFT tube. So there's three techniques for cleaning up geometry. Again, uh, under the repair tab, these three are going to be your uh, your main tools. There's a bunch more. Uh, I don't have time to go into today, but you can see there's the ability to fix things, fix curves, adjust things. Um, they're fantastic tools. They will work until they don't. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, our error messages down at the bottom don't uh, don't tell us what we want. And so um, I would say if you're spending more than five minutes trying to use these tools, uh, just put a sphere around it, combine it with the rest of your geometry and then fill it back in. Uh, sometimes we just need to kind of cut our losses and, and move on. Okay, so those are uh, sort of the repair tools and techniques that we would use to clean up some geometry. Uh, let's say we've got clean geometry. So there, our next model here is a solid model uh, and uh, we're gonna use the fill tool again and we're gonna use the round tool. So uh, the round tool is specifically designed for removing round. So just a quick reminder on the fill tool. Uh, what it does is use you highlight geometry. If you hit fill, it's going to remove that geometry and then take any other surfaces that were touching it and try to project them and kind of fill it back in. The fill tool can both take away a protrusion and also take away a sort of a, a cut, if you will. So text is a very popular one. So for example, I've got a cast part or a plastic injection molded part. Uh, or, uh, or forged or some sort of part that's got a bunch of drafts, radii, text imprints. Uh, for structural analysis reasons, we don't want to include all this detail. So the real simple way to do that is to a combination of our fill and select tool. Last week we showed the lasso select, the box select is pretty straightforward. Um, I'm going to just reposition this so I don't select too many things, but once I grab that, I want to check and make sure I have all the surfaces, right? Which means I have all the vertical surfaces, I have all the planar surfaces, and I don't have too much or too little, and I can just hit my fill tool and it goes away. So I know it always looks easier when we're watching the video. Uh, the next thing is the round tool. And again, the fill tool can remove rounds. So let's say I'm, I'm over here uh, and I'm selecting one round or I double click to get both rounds and I can just remove it just like that. Another thing that is unique, let's go over to uh, prepare and remove round. So what's unique about the prepare remove round tool is I've got a little bit more logic in my selection basis. So first off, I can't select anything other than rounds. So I can't accidentally fill in geometry that I want. And secondly is, again, if I were to grab this and then double click and I get this whole uh, tangential uh, sweep, if you will, of rounds, I can go over to the selection tab and inside the selection tab, it calculates for a second but I've got some additional logic in here. And again, cleaning up the model is as much about being smart in your selection as it is about using the right tool. So in this case, I've chosen the prepare round tool because I wanna grab either all radii less than two, and you can see it's highlighted now, all, excuse me, all radii that are equal to two. So you can see I've highlighted all the radii that are equal to two on the model or grab all rounds that are equal and smaller two. So again, when we're dealing with uh, I'll hit the green check mark. When we're dealing with cast, forged, plastic injection molded parts, you're not going to find any sharp edges on that model at all whatsoever. You're going to find a, a huge uh, distribution of small radii, smaller radii, maybe some large ones, uh, and the sharp edges really can't have in it for manufacturing reasons. And so um, these, this prepare round tool and using the selection logic is a great way to kind of get everything out of the model all at once. As you can see, in some cases, it can crunch uh, quite a bit before it removes everything. And whew, wiped the sweat off my brow. The laptop didn't crash this time. But um, maybe in the future, we could sort of select just a few things. One of the reasons that it takes a long time to, to solve is, uh, and you can see it, it did not catch one of these advanced sort of, I'll say, complex radii here. Uh, one of the reasons it takes so long is because it's trying to connect all of the surfaces that are left all at once. So let's go over to our pillow block. Here's another example of a part that's got a lot of rounds on it, various uh, concave and convex rounds, various sizes. And here's another example of a complex round corner. And so if I were to do the same thing, prepare, round, double click, and then I'm going to control double click double click, double click, this gets me all of those four rounds and a very complex corner. And if I just hit the green check mark, spin, 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 
I'm going to hit escape for a second. Because what it's trying to do is it's taking a long time trying to get all of the surfaces to work and project back to the sharp corners that are underneath the radii. I hope I caught the escape key in time. If you catch the escape key in time, uh, you can stop it from trying to crunch. And I was supposed to hit it in time. Let's give it a second here. Excellent. So sit here, cross your fingers, hit the escape key and try to get out of that action. So here's a technique that we can try to overcome some of that anxiety of hoping it doesn't crash on us. So if I go to the round tool again, instead of uh, selecting that round by the surface, if I hover over the edge, you can see, let's get a smaller round for a second. Hopefully you can see that there's actually, as I'm over this edge, there's two pink lines. I'm just gonna try to keep it there. Hopefully you can see there's two pink lines that are now slicing that radius. And if I just click on that edge, what I do is I'm, I'm basically cap or cut that radius off just in that section. And as you can see, what I actually do is I, sorry, I isolate this part of that complex corner. So I'm gonna do that again right here. I've got, I've got the edge covered over, I've got two pink lines. And all I'm doing is just kind of capping or uh, cutting away that radii. I'm gonna do it two more times on this one right here. Again, I wanna get the edge and I wanna get the edge. And so what I've done now is I've actually isolated this complex corner. So I'm still in that round tool, double click, control, double click, double click, double click. And I've got all those radii in that complex corner. And now when I hit the green check mark, I'm able to remove it. Oh, it was faster in practice. <laughs> it always is, right? Uh, see if we can get that sharp corner to pop up. If we do, I won't do the other one. Okay, so a little bit of an error message down here. I, I think it was getting a little confused, but you can see we've successfully trimmed out that corner. So if you've got a large, again, forging, casting, plastic injection mold apart, I'm not going to gamble on the other corner here, but I hope it shows a new method for, uh, you know, asking any computer software program to do more uh, than uh, it wants is, is, is a sort of gambling with, uh, with uh, a failure there. So uh, great technique here in the prepare rounds tab using this cap, cap width, uh, we're able to isolate and, and clean that up. So that is uh, a little bit of simplifying and defeaturing uh, using so, uh, various selection tools, whether it's box select or some of the logical selection tools that are available in our selection tab as well as using the prepare rounds tool to isolate some really complex corners and try to get them out of there. So uh, the next thing I wanna look at is uh, some face splitting. So there's a various reasons why we might wanna split a face. Uh, and an example might be, let's say for example, I'm doing a structural analysis and I want to uh, have a particular surface that is going to be a load or a boundary condition or a mesh control, right? So if I've got a load, for example, that's gonna be a certain diameter, maybe it's underneath the washer head or underneath the bolt head, it's not as large as this, it's not as small as this, I might want to uh, put our circle on here and then uh, what we call imprint or slice up that surface. So I've got three techniques I wanna show you and all three are a little bit different and all three might uh, line up with what you're looking for. The first one is a face curve. So over here on sketch, I've got a face curve. And what this does is it projects a spline onto a face or a series of faces. And so let's say, for example, I wanted to put uh, and, and take this corner and isolate this corner for whatever reason. I'm just gonna grab a spline. I'm going around three, three surfaces here and I connect it back up. You can see I now have a closed contour or a closed loop. You can see that it's been automatically projected onto the surfaces that I was hovering over. And if I just hit the green check mark, I now have that split up, I can escape out of that tool and I can grab those now, whereas before I wasn't able to isolate that. An example for this might be a drop test where I'm dropping it onto a corner or I've got a cell phone, for example, dropping on a corner. Uh, when I do a dynamic analysis like that or an explicit analysis, impact analysis, uh, there's a lot happening in a, in a very short amount of time on that corner. I wanna make sure I have a really high mesh density. And so this might be one of those reasons why I would isolate this corner 
I don't want to have that mesh density on everything. It would take too long to solve. So real simple way to just kind of take a corner or a, a subset of your surfaces and just sketch a face curve on it and then uh, split it up that way. Of course, we have very limited control over what that shape is. So if you're looking for a little more control, maybe that's not the right tool. Maybe the next one is. So the next one is going to be on our split face. And so that is under design and split. So underneath the intersect group of tools under design, we have all of our Boolean operations. We talked about combine a little bit last week. Split is a tool that allows us to split a face. And there's actually four different methods that we can use to split a face. I'm gonna walk through two of them. Uh, let's say I wanted to split this face, um, just so you're aware, uh, there is what we call a UV cutter. What that means is it basically just puts crosshairs on here and I can split this in uh, an X and a Y or a U and a V, if you will. Uh, so if I just start clicking, I'll start splitting that up. I can also do a, uh, a normal. I just kind of hover over here, uh, do a normal, and then whatever uh, edge I'm referencing or I'm hovering over, it's going to create a, a normal surface. And you can see I've got some numbers like percentages from the edge or a certain distance. So if I've got a, a certain way I want to cut that up, I can. These two are a little bit, I think, more popular. So this one would be click on uh, an actual line. So I can actually sketch an exact line. I don't have to use a predetermined sort of no normal constraint or prohibitive constraint or UV constraint. But let's say I wanted to split this face. Uh, I want to split this face maybe from, from one, uh, one vertex to the other, right? So as I hover over this curve, uh, you can see that it snaps to sort of a percentage from the closest endpoint. I snap over the halfway point, I get to the other side. So if I wanted to, to break this up, I might say, uh, I'm gonna type in, see how my 17.2 there is in blue. So I know it's uh, editable. So I'm just gonna hit zero on that side. So it's automatically snapped to that vertex. And as I cruise on over here, you can see I start to get to another percentage. I hit zero, enter, and it snaps and it splits that surface. So that's pretty, uh, that's pretty standard, but what I think is actually even cooler is, let's say I wanted to just go part of the way. And typically, if I were to split a surface like this part of the way, that would put me in hot water. It can cause geometry issues. It can cause some potential meshing issues if you're not aware that it's here. But where this is really powerful is in a, a part of structural analysis called fracture mechanics. So I might want to analyze a part that has or will crack. And there are times where we want to have the geometry. We have to model in, in some way, a little bit of a crack. And then through structural analysis, we want to understand what load would it take for that crack to propagate. And that's a category of FEA that we call uh, fracture mechanics, which is a little bit different than a typical FEA where I grab one side, I put a load on the other, and I bend it and see if it's going to hit its yield strength or not. Um, so fracture mechanics is one of those things where we've got a little bit more pre-processing and using this uh, using this point-to-point -point cutter and being able to split the surface partially or even split geometry partially is a great way to prepare for fracture mechanics. Uh, the other, which is really unique, uh, I'm, I'm going to hide the bearing here, uh, and I just think this is just unique, um, is uh, there's a lot of tools kind of embedded in space plane that are Boolean operation tools. And an example would be uh, this last one here. So let's say I wanted to split uh, the race of this bearing. And so that is my surface to get uh, split up. I have a cutter down here and I can use any surface and it will automatically project that surface, uh, intersect it with uh, the surface of interest uh, in a Boolean operation and split it. You can see I'm hovering over here, but hopefully you can see that I've got two sort of pink curves that are showing up. You can kind of see them pop in. And as soon as I grab that surface, I've now isolated, uh, excuse me, and split that surface up. So um, again, now that these tools are here and kind of in, in my head, as I start preparing more geometry, I'm going to start using them a lot more because I can recognize, oh, this surface over here, I'm going to use that as a Boolean operation. I can split this other surface, prepare for, for example, um, if I had a bearing load on here and I wanted to have uh, a higher mesh in this area. Um, I don't have to go to any other tools. I'm just in my, my split tool. This is in the design tab. Okay, the last one is imprint. And so uh, if I'm in my prepare tab and I go to imprint, what imprint does, and let me bring back our bearing for a second here, let me escape and get back into imprint. So what imprint does is I've got two adjacent bodies and 
the surfaces of those bodies are different shapes, different sizes, but they touch. So they're either coplanar for a section or they're, uh, they're, they coexist in a cylindrical or spherical shape for, for a, a, a section. And particularly for a structural contact analysis. So let's say, for example, I, I want to analyze some of the preloading that I have on these threaded fasteners. I've got two small uh, threaded fasteners here. I've got a set screw here. Okay. If I remove the bearing for a second, you can see, let me hit escape. You can see that I have a full surface on my cylindrical surface. These are uh, idealistic uh, threaded surfaces. I'm going to go into my imprint tool and grab all of the let's grab bearing. Let's highlight everything. Hit imprint. It's going to run through that little algorithm and look for things that can imprint. And you can see what it's highlighted is it's highlighted uh, areas where this bearing is touching those threaded surfaces or those modeled, I'll say, those cylindrical surfaces. So I can just grab those, and as soon as I click on those areas, uh, I, I'm going to get a curve there. It's going to imprint the surface from one onto the other. I'm just going to hit escape, and let's take that bearing away for a second. So now you can see that I've actually done another Boolean operation on that surface. And this is perfect for a contact. So in a contact analysis, let's say I wanted to particularly analyze the stress on the surface between this set screw and the bearing that goes into. Well, when I do a contact analysis, I have to associate it to two pairs. And I would select this surface as one pair and the surface on the bearing is another. If I chose the full surface and I start to begin a contact structural analysis, which is a nonlinear analysis, I have to iterate through every load step and find out, are these surfaces interfering? Are those surfaces interfering? What are these elements doing? What are those nodes doing? That's why nonlinear contact analyses take about 10 times as long as a, as a simple static structural. And it's because it's looking at sets of elements and sets of nodes. Well, whenever we do an imprint, what we do is we isolate the potential surfaces that are included in those contact uh, equations. And so by imprinting this, I can say the contact is actually going to be between this surface, not the whole surface, just this surface and the other surface. And what that does is it, it lessens what we call the computational overhead. It lessens the amount of work the computer has to do. So I can't express it enough because we see it quite a bit. Uh, we've been talking a lot to our customers lately about contact analysis and how do we reach convergence and how do we manage our mesh. And I have not seen this done often enough. And it, by imprinting surfaces that coexist, what we're doing is we're isolating the physics, we're isolating the contact uh, around these areas. So imprint, 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 I can't say it enough. That's gonna be underneath your prepare tab over here underneath our analysis preparation. Okay, I think we are done with this pillow block and we're gonna move on to uh, four and five from our slides. So four is a focus on preparing for structural analysis uh, specifically. And in particular, when we have a, uh, for example, this is a welded structure and it has a very high aspect ratio. What that means is I have a very high ratio of the largest dimension in the model compared to the smallest dimension in the model. Again, last week we went through the measure, but if I were to use the measure, I could go in here and say, let's just grab this guy and grab this guy up top and just get a feeling for how tall this thing is. Uh, you can see down here at the very bottom, you know, I'm at seven meters. Uh, and if I go and I zoom in down here and I grab this and this, you can see that we're at 12 millimeters. So really, really high ratio between the largest dimension and the smallest dimension. So here's an example where if I wanted to understand uh, what a load might do up here, how much would it move? or I want to do a modal analysis and find out what the, the first modal frequency is, um, I don't need to mesh through the thickness of the solid model, right? So if I were to mesh through this uh, traditional static FEA tells me I need at least three elements. I need at least calculate uh, compression, the neutral zone and, the, and, and tension if I'm going to have any sort of beam and bending. So I need to have at least three in there. Well, I'm going to have a lot of elements. And if we make a simplification of turning this into a zero thickness shell uh, or a mid-plane shell, uh, then I can just mathematically type in the thickness and I can make an assumption there. Uh, I can solve it in about 10, you know, one tenth of the time. So to do that, to take our solid model and convert it to uh, a mid-plane shell or a shell, if you will, uh, that is going to be underneath our prepare tab, underneath mid-surface. 
And again, it's going to be automatically doing it. But whenever we say automatic, we kind of get questionable on the software. It's all about how we set it up. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use uh, this use range. And this use range, uh, believe it or not, has now sort of predicted, if you will, I've got a small thickness of 12.7 and a large thickness of 50.8. So it kind of analyzed the model for us. And if I were to just box select everything in here, it's going to look for uh, surfaces that are uh, offset of each other in distances between this range. And I hit the green check mark. And I'm going to get through this preview, you can see what's happened. I've got a solid model that's transparent, and I can see that I've got a midplane in between here, and I've got a midplane in the flange down at the bottom. And we've got an option on the left called extend surfaces. By having this option for extend surfaces checked, I can see that I have actually extended this surface down to the midplane. It's one of the challenges that we have when we're doing midplane surfaces is I'm now left sometimes with a gap because I've got the thickness that's being taken away. But this option here for extent services allows us to get around that. And I'm just going to click out into open space. I'm done with the preview and I can see what I'm left with. If I look to the left in my tree, I can see now I've got the solid model still there. You can see that it is uh, kind of not grayed out, but you can see that not the full color is there. I don't have the checkbox. And also I've got a little circle here with a slash through it. And what that means is it has been suppressed for physics, meaning it's still there. You can still see it, right? The geometry is still there. But any downstream action I do as I go into my structural analysis tool, I go into ANSYS Mechanical, it's not going to recognize the 3D geometry. It's only going to recognize the mid-surfaces. So again, Space Claim, CAD Modeler, a lot of cool tools. But a lot of these tools in Space Claim are specifically designed for structural analysts and structural analysis and fluid dynamics and thermal. So a lot of really cool things available in this tool that aren't necessarily available in some of the other sort of native CAD programs, if you will. So um, after I create my mid-plane surfaces, one thing I have to make sure is I have to make sure they're connected, meaning I have to make sure that as I go downstream, as I start meshing this for a structural analysis, I need to know and ensure that this shell is touching this shell and that the software knows that this shell is touching the shell so that it can associate essentially these this edge together and weld it right if we don't do anything if we were to just save this mesh it and move forward all of these little uh, gussets would fly off into space and to do that we need to go to workbench and we need to do what's called sharing topology what that does is if i've got multiple pieces of geometry that are touching I need to share the surfaces or edges or points or whatever the geometry is, I have to share that so that when I mesh it and when I solve it, it knows that the surfaces are connected. So a lot of times we also call this continuity. Do we have continuity between our parts? And so I'm just gonna click the share button here. It's gonna run through an algorithm and recognize that I've got edges of my shells that are touching and I need to share them. And I'm gonna hit the green check mark. And now after I have shared the topology, I now have the lines that are highlighted. And you can see I have an option here called show connectivity. Again, I want to know, I want to prove to myself before I save and move on to meshing that I am connected. I've got continuity from one structural component to the other. And you can see here, I've got um, purple edges so that are shared. That's the uh, shared display. I can toggle those on and off for purple. And I've got free edges that are red and I can toggle those on and off. So a free edge would be an edge that's hanging out in space. And again, you can play with colors, you can play with various criteria. Um, but here is, before we've even gone into, for example, workbench meshing for structural, I'm now able to really audit my model and say, hey, uh, do I have continuity? Do I have shared topology? And if I don't, I've got all the tools here to do that. Okay, so that's a little bit of the structural analysis side. Uh, the, the bench goes even deeper, so to speak. Uh, there's beam extraction. Uh, there's other simplification techniques. I wanted to keep this somewhat tight. We're already at about 30, no, we're at like 45 minutes. So I'm going to move on over to two models for CFD preparation. And one thing that's unique about CFD preparation, of course, we have to model the fluid. So the two most common fluids are air and water, right? A gas and a liquid. Uh, and the two most 
methods for analyzing it, we just kind of break it into two categories. Are you dealing with internal flow or are you dealing with external flow, right? So are we dealing with external aerodynamics like a car in a wind tunnel or are we dealing with internal flow like hydraulics or in this case, uh, we've got a, a really cool kind of arc jet, if you will, uh, application. So um, one of the things that uh, you've probably spent quite a bit of time doing if you've uh, prepared a model like this for CFD before is making sure that a large assembly doesn't have any holes or gaps or anything. So traditionally, if I didn't have space claim, I'd be in my CAD tool like Creo, and I'd be trying to create another model, and then I'd try to, you know, have it come right up to the edge and do a boolean operation. I can't even tell you how many hours I spent trying to prepare uh, a, a parametric boolean operation for uh, a fluid and an assembly. It's a real kind of pain in the butt. Of course. Uh, space claim has the ability to do that, but what it also has the ability to do is help troubleshoot when it doesn't work. So in uh, our prepare tab, we've got two uh, volume extractions and exclosure. So these are the two main tools that we we'll use to create a fluid volume. In this case, I'm doing internal flow and I want to extract the volume. Before I do that, let's just show you X for cross section, uh, grab this surface and move it. And just so we can see what's going on inside here. Uh, that's what the inside looks like. Uh, we've got uh, uh, an outlet here, we've got some inlets here, we've got a combustion chamber, and we've got uh, who knows what kind of uh, fluid path we have in there with some fluid circuit. Um, I'm not an expert in this design. The designer handed over to me and said, hey, tell me how hot this thing's going to get. Tell me how much thrust it's going to make. And so we say, okay, you know what, let's, uh, let's just put a volume in it and then slide it over to ANSYS Fluent and see what happens. So what I'm going to do is extract the volume from the inside of this part. And so the workflow goes like this. The first thing I'm going to do with this icon here is select faces that enclose the region. So I have to have some understanding of the outlet and the inlet. So this is the outlet and these are the inlets. So I'm going to hold uh, these surfaces down. I don't have to hit control here. I'm just going to grab these surfaces. Uh, and so what I'm doing is I'm kind of capping, if you will, what the extents of the model are. The next thing I need to do is grab an interior surface. And so basically what the sort of algorithm here does is it starts with interior surface and it starts to track what's the next surface next to it, what's the next surface next to that. And it's gonna keep expanding these surfaces until it hits the ends of the model. And if we've done our homework right, we've grabbed all the ends of the model, it, it highlights all the surfaces that are inside our model, and then we hit the green checkbox and we have a nice fluid volume. Of course, it's not always that easy, right? So, we always want to preview what happens if we were to hit the green checkbox. If we don't preview it, sometimes we could get stuck with, you know, waiting forever or we get an error. And when we preview this, what we're looking for is red surfaces on the inside of the model. So I want to see that if I have done my selections properly, I only see red surfaces on the inside of the model. If that's the case, I can hit the green checkbox and I know I'm going to cap off the, the, the volume inside for, for fluid. In this case, we have a problem, right? So in this case, we're seeing red on the entire part. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to slide. This is kind of like a, a sliding from the beginning to the end, right? So if I start all the way on the left, this is that model, excuse me, this is that surface that I uh, established as, as the seed surface, if you will, or the beginning surface of the inside. As I slide it to the right, you can see exactly what the software is doing. It's saying, what's the next surface next to me, right? To the left, it stopped because that was at our outlet. And to the right, it's going to keep going. So we can actually see exactly when it goes from the inside to the outside of the model. So I'm on the inside, I'm on the inside, I'm on the inside, I'm on the outside. And the outside, it just creeped over to this outer surface. And as you can see, there's a little maybe a sensor hole or a bung or something that I forgot to include in my inlet selection. So I'm going to go right back over to inlet selection and I'm just going to add it. So everything is, I'm still in the tool. I haven't left the tool. All of my selections are still there. I still have my, my other inlets and outlet. I still have my seed surface. I've now added another inlet. I'm going to go back to preview. And if we've done everything right, we only have the red surface on the inside. So perfect. So now we only see red surface on the inside. I can hit my green check bar, check mark and it has created a surface, excuse me, a volume inside. I'm going to hide everything, and this last volume here, I turn it on, and that is a nice, beautiful, parametric, watertight surface that if I'm not doing heat transfer, I can bring just this model, just this body, into, CFD, into Fluent, mesh it with Fluent meshing, and move on from there. Uh, if I am doing heat transfer, and I bring in all my other parts as well. So, 
again, Boolean operation, I'm connecting my, my assembly to my interior model. There's a lot of CAD tools that can do that, but Space Claim has tools specifically for troubleshooting when it doesn't work. And nine times out of 10, it doesn't work, especially if you're receiving geometry from someone else. Okay, the last bit here, and again, thank you guys so much for those that are still with us. I'm hitting an hour. Each time I do this a little bit longer, I'm probably gonna get yelled at. Uh, the last thing I wanna show uh, is kind of the opposite of an interior volume extraction, but an exterior enclosure. Uh, and so a great example might be a, a natural convection analysis where I have to put a, a, a box of air around electronics component. Here we have a heat exchanger uh, and we wanna put a box of air around it. We wanna solve for natural convection. We wanna create a, a heat plume that's going to rise up. We want that to induce an airflow that's gonna keep this thing cool. We could, for example, grab a car model and put it in a virtual wind tunnel. For example, I'm gonna wrap this thing around with a volume of, uh, of air. So I'm gonna grab this enclosure tool here and it's just giving me uh, some guidance here, select one more bodies. And I'm just gonna grab that and I'm gonna select both those bodies. And right there out of the box, it gives me all of my dimensions. And so general rules of thumb are, you know, if I'm trying to put a box of air around something that's a certain width or length or height, I will have several widths Beyond that, I'll have several lengths beyond that, and I'll have several heights beyond that. And there's a lot of different rules uh, for, for various uh, CFD analyses and various uh, uh, flow regimes. Uh, general rule of thumb might be three on each side here with five above or five on each side and 10 above, depending on how complex this uh, natural convection plume might be. Uh, but I can just hit the green check mark here and I've got my box. Um, I'm gonna delete that and I'll just hit control and do. Control and do. So uh, just some of the options here, we've got various shapes. So boxes and cylinders and spheres and custom shapes, if we wanna add any custom shapes. Um, but the one thing I just wanna show, cause this is pretty straightforward, uh, is to align the box. So for a lot of reasons, uh, we might have a coordinate system that's not uh, oriented the, the way that we want it. So there is an option underneath the enclosure tool to grab a reference geometry, for example, this edge. And now I'm aligning that edge to the coordinate system that's being used to create this box and I can hit the green check mark and I have a box. Um, it makes it transparent. I appreciate that a lot. But if I hide my components, you can see I've already accomplished the Boolean operation. So again, if I'm trying to put a box around something just for airflow, no heat transfer, then I would bring this enclosure volume into ANSYS Fluent or CFX and start meshing. If I want heat transfer, uh, in this case, uh, we have heat exchanger. I bring the model in, so I mesh that as well, add my heat uh, fluxes. Uh, and again, this is a, a regular component like all others, so I can go back into my design and I can, you know, grab to my pull, uh, pull tool and start pulling these surfaces um, out and away from my model from there. I can also, if you recall, uh, pull this, enter in a number and parameterize that. And one of the reasons that we would want to parameterize the distance between our uh, model and the outside of our enclosure is we would want to do a sensitivity analysis. So there's a lot of rules of thumb on the distance between my part and the wall of my analysis, but uh, they're all wrong. And the real answer is uh, the smallest possible box that doesn't change the results. So again, a lot of simulation we do is sensitivity analyses uh, and structures and fluids uh, just to get an understanding of how large of a space we need. So that is it for the hands-on side of the demo. Again, I thank you so much for your patience uh, and sticking with us through this whole thing. Um, just to recap, Space Claim is a purpose-built CAD tool for preparing for FEA and CFT. It has tools in it that you just can't find in other CAD tools, and it's got tools in it that just work better than CAD tools. It's specifically designed uh, for preparing for structures and fluids. Uh, what did we just do? We repaired bad geometry, we simplified into featured uh, we split some surfaces up, some faces up, and then we did a couple of unique things for structures and fluids, uh, mid, mid shell extraction, shared topology, and then extracting some of the volumes. So uh, hopefully one of these, uh, you know, maybe not all of them, but one of these hopefully resonated with something that you've been maybe stuck with uh, or something you're working on right now. Uh, next steps, uh, if you have space claim, uh, then go use it, please. I can't even urge you just lay with it. Uh, there's a lot of tools in there. This video and the one we did last week hopefully show some capabilities that you haven't played with yet. So jump in and start playing with it. Uh, if you want more inspiration, the models I have shown you today all came out of the 
ANSYS Learning Hub, I've, she, I've shown you maybe five or 10% of the, of the content that's in the ANSYS Learning Hub. Uh, there are hours and hours and hours and hours of videos there. Uh, guarantees you're going to learn something uh, somewhere deep in there. So, and those are the, those are the real experts who are doing that. So, um, if you don't have access to Space Plane, just shoot us a quick email. It's pretty easy to get a 30 day free demo. Whether you want the standalone tool, so if you're preparing geometry for Workbench, Ansys Mechanical, Ansys Fluent, Ansys CFX, or if you want to see the new discovery tool, which has in it uh, the GPU, the really, really, really fast uh, GPU based solver, uh, or some of the CPU solver stuff. Uh, and again, it does have, I would say, about 75% of the capability I showed you today is, is in that, that discovery tool. And that's just going to keep going up as ANSYS continues to develop that really cool tool. Once again, thank you guys so much. This is the last of our two one-two punch last week and this week, uh, playing with space plane and preparing models and preparing geometry for structures and fluids. Next month, we're going to be talking specifically about fluids and about the new ANSYS fluent meshing technique. So uh, I, we have been doing a lot of phone calls lately on, hey, I'm stuck in ISM CFD, I'm stuck in workbench, I've been splitting my parts, trying to extrude meshes, I want bricks, I want a nice boundary layer, I want inflated, I want it perfect, I want it parametric, all those words that we want for uh, fluent CFX, uh, excuse me, for fluent. We're gonna show you the, the latest, it came out about a year ago. This is the way to do it from now on. So really, really cool stuff unbelievably fast and bulletproof. So that's going to be next month. Thank you so much. If you have any other questions, uh, reach out to us, check out the other videos we have on YouTube. And with that, if you're still here and you still have a question, wide open. Thank you very much. I know it was a lot. I hope it wasn't too much. If it was, we'll get the video up on YouTube and maybe we can. I'm looking as people are leaving. I'm looking at the chat to make sure that there's no chat questions. I don't see any. Paul, uh, where to find YouTube video? Great question. That's going to be, uh, if you go to YouTube and just search for Boston Engineering, you'll find all the videos and uh, you can kind of see in the screenshot at the top, the last five or six or seven uh, are from the series that we've been doing here. Uh, you could call it sort of the COVID webinar series, uh, just trying to get, keep engaged with our, uh, with our users on this stuff. But yeah, a handful of stuff in Creo if you're a Creo user, and of course, a handful of stuff on Ansys. Uh, we've been doing, we did Discovery, done two here on Space Claim, uh, and we're going to keep, keep doing it. Very welcome, Paul. Very welcome. Uh, don't know if you're seeing it, Jim. Bill's asking, are there any quote unquote air, air quote user guys that can download to help them through this? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, if you go to if you if you already have Space Plane installed, then just go to your start menu in Windows, go to the installation. So Ansys 2020 R2, for example, and right towards the top, you're going to have an Ansys help. That Ansys help is going to bring you to the web based Ansys help which is all set up here by, uh, by Alphabet. And if I go to space claim under S I to V E, you can see space claim right here. Once I go to space claim, I can search specifically in the space claim help. This is, this link's going to take me to the full documentation and here's some videos. A lot of these go back to YouTube, um, all from the team at ANSYS. So these are the experts. The other way to do it is ANSYS learning hub, as I mentioned, which is, uh, if you just, I think if you just type in Ansys Learning Hub, you'll, you'll hit the website. Um, if you don't have access to the Learning Hub, let us know. Uh, pretty much any Ansys user can get kind of a quick preview freebie, look at it, uh, and, then, uh, and, then, and then get access for, the, for, for a year after that. Um, if you do have access to it, uh, just try a login, or I think it's all tied to your email. So all good stuff. Great. I think uh, I think we hit everything. We hit the hour mark. I have to trim this down a little bit. So next time we'll maybe one less demo. Huh? <laughs> Thanks everybody for sticking around for the whole hour here. I hope one thing or hopefully a few more things kind of resonated with you and, and will help you work through your problem. If not, shoot us an email. We'll be glad to help as well.
take care, everybody. Stay safe, and we will talk soon. Okay, Jim, give us a chat call, and we'll follow up. Okay.